Today on Applied Science, we're going to talk about ultraviolet light. I'm going to test different ultraviolet safety glasses and different kinds of sunscreen to see how effective they are. And we'll try to answer the age-old question, can you get sunburned through glass? In addition, uh, if you want to find a material that passes ultraviolet light, we'll check out some uh, different options for that. For example, if you're making screen printing masks. And to do all this, we're going to use this cool deuterium light source and a spectrometer. So let's start with the uh, deuterium light source. In order to do experiments with ultraviolet absorption, we'd like to have a light source that is really broadband. In other words, it has a very smooth output across all the different wavelengths we want to study. Um, you've probably seen these color output charts for fluorescent tubes, and they look very spiky. Uh, in other words, there's a really high peak in one color, and then there's not very much output until you get to the next color, and so on. But this is not helpful for us if we want to measure how much light a material is going to absorb, like for example safety glasses or sunscreen. So these deuterium light sources are specifically made to have nice smooth broadband output into very far into the ultraviolet spectrum. The deuterium lamp itself is actually built fairly similarly to an ordinary fluorescent tube. It has four leads, just like uh, having two pins on either side of a fluorescent tube, and it has a heater in there, that's for two of the leads and the heater is just to make it easier to start the arc. It's a low pressure discharge lamp, and um, normally you could probably start the arc in other ways, but using a heater is pretty easy. So when you turn the power supply on, it warms up for about five or 10 seconds. And then when the power supply detects that the arc has struck, it turns the heater off. Very similar to a standard old fashioned fluorescent ballast. The reason to use deuterium in the first place is because it has this um, really smooth broadband output in UV, and the reason is pretty interesting. Uh, for the most part, the emission is similar to hydrogen, as you'd expect, but hydrogen is easier to ionize than deuterium is, which means that more of the energy that you put into it is going to go into the emission lines that are characteristic of hydrogen. But as I said earlier, we don't want these emission lines. What we want is a nice broadband output. So with deuterium, more of the energy that you put into it comes out as this uh, very uh, continuous molecular emission spectra, which is like a complicated way of saying it, but you, you can change the energy state of a molecule and it can output at any sort of energy level it wants. It doesn't have to be a specific atomic emission. I'll put a link to Wikipedia if you want to hear more about this. Okay, so we've got our deuterium lamp fired up and um, running stably. It even has this little baffled light cover here, and the output is on this side. There's a couple of lenses to uh, collimate the beam somewhat, and we're shining it into the end of a quartz fiber, and the quartz fiber runs over there in this blue jacket into the spectrometer, and then we'll read it out on the computer screen. And the idea here is that we can put things between the light source and the input to the spectrometer, and then check to see how the output changes. Okay, let's start with a baseline reading with nothing between the fiber and the light source. So you can see here that the live trace is in black. So if I put my hand here, you can see the black trace goes away. And you can see the reference colors here just to get an idea of how far into the UV we're going. So 400 is typically the bluest light that you can sort of see. And then we're going all the way to 200 nanometers with this uh, deuterium light source. For reference, I also put in a trace from an overcast day aiming up at the sky and a trace from a very sunny day also aiming up at the sky. So you can see that the sun is, of course, much, much brighter than this light source, even measured a few centimeters away. But the light source has way more deep ultraviolet light. So for these ultraviolet absorption measurements we're going to make, it's actually going to be much easier to use this deuterium lamp than even the sun itself. So I'm going to clear the traces from the sunlight, and I'm going to change the uh, exposure time to be about 30 milliseconds so that we can get better dynamic range. And I'm going to set the number of scans that we're going to average uh, lower because we don't need to worry about it. The deuterium lamp actually does flicker, so at the shorter exposure time of just 4 milliseconds, uh, in order to make it comparable to sunlight, I'd have to do a lot of averaging of scans to keep the trace from jumping around. So let's say 30 milliseconds is good. Uh, this will give us good dynamic range. And then I'll also change um, the scale 
so that we can zoom in on just the part of the spectrum that we want to see. So now, if we take uh, a piece of ordinary window glass and just put the glass between the probe and the light source, you can see that there's a, a huge amount of U ultraviolet absorption. It is true that pretty much everything below 300 is, is almost gone, and you can see the response is pretty quick. So we could use this setup sort of qualitatively and just say, oh, okay, um, glass is good to, you know, 320 nanometers. Uh, and then I've got another material here. This is actually a, a plastic knife, disposable knife. That one has a, a little bit more UV, cuts off at maybe 280 or 290. But it would be nicer if we could say in terms of percent how much light is getting through for a given wavelength. So we can set up the machine to do this or the spectrometer to do this. What we'll do is uh, save the waveform that we're currently looking at and then request this transmittance profile. And then for some reason it changes the uh, axes a bit again, so I'll just set this back to what I want. We're going to look between 200 and 600 nanometers and the output is going to be in percent. And I've selected 120 percent so that you can kind of more easily see the 100. So we'll set this to run. And of course everything is 100 percent now because that was the reference waveform that we just got. And I'm going to turn off the color bar. That's a little distracting. Now, if we take the window glass and put it back into the profile, this is reading off in percent getting through the window glass. Pretty convenient. And if we left click somewhere, we can see the exact percent number as this Y value. So at 340 nanometers, window glass passes about 64%. Uh, down here in the low range, so let's say right at 300, we're only getting 0.1 or 0.2 percent at 300 nanometers. And then just to make sure the system is working kind of the way we would expect, if I take a piece of metal, which should not pass any ultraviolet light, we can see that the reading is pretty darn close to zero if I hang here. It's, it's way down in the noise. So with the window glass, if we're reading, oops, if we're reading 0.2, that actually seems like a real value. A piece, a piece of metal only reads 0 0.02. So this 0.2% uh, seems like a real value at 300. Okay, let's try the first pair of safety glasses. These are ultraviolet safety glasses sold with uh, UV cure adhesive from Amazon. And they are pretty generic. I couldn't find any brand name or any sort of a model number or anything on there. So we'll put those in, and you can see that they do a very good job of, of cutting out certainly 300 nanometer wavelength light. At 350, it's like 0.1% or something. At 405, which is actually the wavelength that you would be using your UV cure adhesive most likely, they only let through 1% or so. This next pair of goggles uh, came with my 450 nanometer um, laser cutter, a little desktop laser cutter. Put this one on there. Uh, interestingly, this one actually allows through some ultraviolet light at around 388 nanometers. Still far down here, it's quite low, 0.2%. And finally, these are safety glasses not meant to protect you from ultraviolet but they are meant to protect you from ruby laser light. So let's just put this in here just to see what the effect of having, of using the wrong safety glasses might be. Uh, and as you can see, these actually let through a ton of ultraviolet light. In fact, at you know, 365 nanometer, it's letting through 65% of the light about. And even at 322, it's still appreciable at four or five percent. I'm going to run through some other materials and it's pretty much the same process for each one. So I'll just show you the results at the end. This is PMMA or acrylic. And now let's try some unusual materials. Uh, these are made to block ultraviolet light from getting into a photopolymer tank. 
So if you have one of these 3D printers that uses light to cure the resin, it uses the wavelength 405 nanometer. And uh, the trick is you can't make, you want to block all that light from getting into the machine or getting to the resin. So all the tanks are made out of this special material that blocks ultraviolet. So let's test how good it is. So we noticed that the uh, green material is actually better at stopping 405 nanometers than the orange material uh, used in this um, 3D printer system. So as a sanity check, I wanted to uh, test it out with my 405 nanometer laser pointer. So I've got a, a fluorescent material here. The, the laser itself is purple. Hopefully this is showing up on the, um, on the camera. And when I hit the phosphor, it turns green. So if I shine the laser through the little bit of orange material, uh, check out what happens. <laughs> There's still quite a bit of 405 getting through because the phosphor is turning green, right? So the laser is purple, the material is orange. Uh, but when I shine through, we're getting the effect from the uh, phosphor. Let's try the same thing with the green material. It's kind of dark green. If we shine through, there's almost nothing. I can't see any um, any phosphorescence going on there at all. And see, there's there's the laser. So it does an amazingly better job of blocking 405 nanometer, at least. Not really UV, but 405. Um, just something to keep in mind if you're ever designing... Uh, a system where you want to keep 405 nanometer out, uh, choose the green material. And finally, I'm going to test this vellum, which I used in the uh, screen printing video. The challenge here is that the vellum is uh, not transparent. So all the materials that we've tested so far are clear. And when I put them this far away from the fiber, the light basically just passes straight through. And uh, the fact that the it doesn't change the direction of the light, it just absorbs it. The problem with this vellum is that it is um, diffusive and it, this will interfere majorly with the absorption measurement. So if we put this here, instead of all the light going straight into the fiber, it, it comes in at different angles and would change the reading. So this one is definitely not going to be, um, the intensity is not going to be correct. But note there's something very interesting going on. We're actually getting more uh, more light passing from less than 300 nanometers than we are from any of the other materials that we tested so far. It has the smoothest transmission, even though it's lower across all the wavelengths. And finally, let's test a piece of fused quartz. So it looks like glass, but it is in fact fused quartz. Let's put this in here. And it is amazingly good. It's actually very close to 100% all the way down to 250 nanometers. Um, this is why we used fused quartz to uh, move ultraviolet light. Okay, let's try something here. Now I'm going to take this uh, window of fused quartz and spray some of this SPF 100 sunscreen on it. And this is hardly scientific, of course, but I just sprayed some on there and kind of rubbed it around a bit. Now there's this one component of the sunscreen is quickly evaporating and the rest of it will stay on the surface of this as a film. So interestingly, it's a very consistent five or 6% transmission, at least at the film thickness that I put on there for, for the whole UV range pretty much. And um, above 400, it's, it's still cutting out some of the light. I mean, it's passing about 80%. So let me try uh, taking it out and just sort of re-rubbing across here just to kind of get another sample, just to see if this really changes much. And you can kind of get a sense of um, how much is on here. I mean, it's not a huge amount. It's probably fairly similar to what would be on skin. Okay, so that's interesting. So we're getting about... 2% transmission now in this uh, region of, you know, 300 and something nanometers. 2%, let's say. Okay, let me clean this off and we'll try it with the other sunscreen. And this time I'm going to use uh, 50 SPF. And this one is not a spray, so it's going to be even tougher to, uh, to get kind of a reasonable sort of film. But, you know, this is not really a scientific test. It's pretty much dumb luck, but we're getting about twice as much uh, UV between 300 and 350 as we did with the previous sunscreen. 
and this happens to be SPF 50, which is half as high as SPF 100. Although, as you've probably heard, these SPF numbers are not really the most, you know, scientific things themselves, kind of more marketing. So the question is, is 5% enough? Is 10% enough? How do I know if I'm going to get a sunburn or not? And so I started researching this and found out that, uh, you know, it's been researched quite extensively and they've come up with this thing called the erythema action spectrum or the CIE action spectrum. And what this shows is how sensitive your body is to getting a sunburn to a specific wavelength of light. And note that the y-axis is actually logarithmic. So this means that anything, any wavelength longer than about 330 nanometers has almost no chance of giving you a sunburn. I mean, it's true that if you had enough exposure at these wavelengths, you might get uh, sunburned, but it's a thousand times less uh, potent than wavelengths shorter than about 300. So there's, it's very important to know exactly um, how much ultraviolet or what wavelength of ultraviolet light is going through the material that you want to protect your skin or your eyes. And as we saw, most materials are quite good at keeping uh, stuff shorter than 310 nanometer out of you. Uh, the, even window glass does it. So to, the short answer is it's very difficult to get sunburn through window glass because it does such a good job of stopping all the wavelengths shorter than you know, 330 for sure. You've probably heard these terms UVA, UVB, and UVC. It's a pretty arbitrary uh, definition, but it does actually make sense when thinking about um, skin exposure to the sun, where UVA has almost, almost no chance of giving you a sunburn. Uh, this includes things like black lights, um, fluorescent lamps that are meant for day glow posters, that sort of thing. The UVB is actually the thing that you have to worry about. Yeah, the last thing I wanted to mention was this concept of optical density. So a lot of times you'll see OD7 for with the stated wavelength range. So on these professional actual um, optical safety glasses, it's important to know precisely how much light they stop. So the optical density scale is just a logarithmic way of describing how much light goes through. And uh, the reason you would want this is that if you're stopping 99.99% of light, and then you come up with a better material or you double the thickness or something and now you're stopping 99.9999% of light, it gets to be kind of silly to say how many nines, you know, 0.9% you've got there. So optical density is just a logarithmic scale, just like we use dB in RF and power electronics. It just makes more sense when you're talking about all these orders of magnitude. So optical density is negative log base 10 of the percent transmittance over 100. So if you're transmitting 1%, 1 over 100, it's going to be a log of that is 2, so uh, or negative 2, and then you take the negative of that, so optical density 2. So optical density 7 is uh, 7 orders of magnitude of, of um, resistance. Let's see if we can make an optical density measurement for these unknown safety glasses. So we're back up to the uh, standard setup here. We're pretty close to 100% transmittance, and we'll put the safety glasses carefully in without moving anything, hopefully. Okay, now if we try to measure this directly, let's say we want to know at 300 nanometers, the reading is super low. It's like, you know, 0 0.05%, uh, and that's getting close to the noise at zero. So what I'll do is increase the exposure time by 10x, and we'll see what this does to the reading. It looks like it's stabilized at 0.62%. And then just to play around a bit here, let me change the number of averages to one and then increase the exposure time to three full seconds. Okay, so I was kind of hoping this was gonna be linear. So at 30 milliseconds, we were getting an unreadable thing. At 300 milliseconds, we were getting like 0.6%. And at 3,000 milliseconds, I was expecting or hoping this was going to be close to 6%, but it's actually more like 2.25. So this sort of implies that the true transmittance is between um, 0 0.06 and 0 0.02. So let's just say it's 0 0.04. Okay, so 0.04% divided by 100 minus log base 10 of that comes out to be about 3.4 which is um, kind of reasonable for safety glasses like this. Um, these were fairly high end and it was marked OD7 at, the, at those wavelengths. OD4 is kind of on the low side for safety glasses, but um, 
for these $5 or whatever off Amazon ones, this 3.4 number is actually pretty reasonable. Okay, see you next time. Bye.